Well, good morning, church. This is such an exciting week, isn't it? It's hard to believe we are just over a week away from Christmas. Right? The wait is almost over. Just in about a week, we'll be back here, right, gathered together, and we will sing songs about the coming of Jesus. Right? In about a week, we'll come and we'll sing songs about the faithfulness of Mary. Maybe even the wise men, maybe even the shepherds will get a, a mention thrown in there. But, but do you want to know who I can pretty much guarantee we won't be singing about next Sunday? Joseph. I'm talking about Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. Now, how can I be so sure of the fact that we won't be singing about him? Well, it's not just because I know the worship team's set list. It's because Joseph is really the forgotten man of Christmas. I don't know if y'all have ever thought about this before, but you don't really see Joseph's name mentioned in many books. You don't see his story talked about in too many sermons. And, and if we're being honest, he really gets easily confused in a lot of nativity scenes with just being one of the shepherd boys, <laughs> right? When it comes to the story of Christmas, Joseph really doesn't have a starring role. In fact, I'm not sure if you know this, but, but Joseph actually has zero lines in all of Scripture. But what we're going to see today in our third week of our Advent series is that Joseph despite not having a starring role, he pays a pivotal role in the Christmas story. And that just like Mary, just like the, the wise men, the shepherd, just like all the rest of them, he too has a very specific purpose given to him by God. And it's a purpose, family, that he discovers in the waiting. That purpose, well, I'm not just going to come out and tell you what that is this morning. I actually thought I'd start by showing you. Okay, so I came across this video about a week or so ago, and I thought that it really perfectly captured the, the heart posture of Joseph. It's a video of a little boy named Milo, and Milo has just learned about the, the role that he's been assigned to play in his school Christmas play. Let's check out this video. Guess what I am for the nativity? I'm a classic one. Classic role, is it? Classic part? Yeah. Um, Joseph? No. Uh... One of the three wise men? No. But it's a classic part? Yeah. Okay, um, you tell me then, because... I'm door holder number three, I'll be holding doors. That's amazing! <laughs> holding doors for who? Um, probably, um, Joseph and Mary. Oh my gosh, were you pleased when they said that? And I was like, I'm a door holder, get in there, let's go, <laughs> yes. I'll have to wear like down. Really? Yeah, probably. Excellent. Oh, well, that's really smart, Milo. Isn't that amazing? Y'all, I've honestly watched that video probably 50 times. I'm not even kidding. Like, there is something about that kid's heart that is just so pure. There is something so amazing, right? He's so excited that he just gets to play a part. Yes, he is very well aware that he is not the star of the show, but yet he is ready. He is willing. He is eager to give it everything that he's got. And that right there, family, is the same posture we see in Joseph. Right? There is a readiness, a willingness to embrace the role that he has been given and to do everything he can to make his life all about Jesus. See, family, this is why Joseph's story is worth remembering this Christmas. This is why his character is worth our attention because he models for us what it means, what it, what it really looks like to have Jesus at the center of your life. And he proves to us that no matter what role we've been assigned to play, that we are all just supporting cast members in this play. Amen? Yeah. And that our purpose is to highlight the true star of the show. Whether we play the role of Mary, Joseph, a wise man, or door holder number three. See, the truth that we've all been reminded of throughout these last couple of weeks in this Advent series is that we all find ourselves in a season of waiting. But no matter what it is you might be waiting for, my, my prayer is that you would have a heart like Joseph and like sweet little Milo, right? A heart that is ready and willing, even eager to do the will of the Lord and to seek his purpose for your life. So before we go any further, let's make that our collective prayer together this morning. Would you join me? Father, we are so grateful just to be gathered here together today. Lord, to celebrate you and to celebrate the coming of Jesus. Lord, I'm so grateful for the ways that you are moving in and through this church. But most of all, Lord, I'm grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus. Would you speak to us this morning, Lord, through your word? Would you reveal more of who he is 
so that we might make more of our lives about him. It's in his holy name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at the story of Christmas through the eyes and the life of Joseph. And we actually find that perspective uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you've got your Bibles or Bible apps, you can open them up to the Gospel of Matthew. This morning we're going to be in chapter 1. As you find your spot there, I thought I would start by sharing just a little bit of context, a little bit of what we know about Joseph. And I'm going to go ahead and be upfront with you. We don't know a whole lot. Right? We really know two things. We know that uh, Joseph is from the family line of David. So if you look early on in Matthew chapter 1, you see that Matthew gives us uh, Joseph's family lineage. So we know that one piece about him. The second thing we know is that Joseph was a craftsman. Now I say craftsman intentionally instead of carpenter. I know we all think of him as a carpenter. But the reality is if you look at the, the Greek word that's used to describe his work, it's the word tekton. And if you look at the surrounding environment around them, where there's not a whole lot of, uh, of trees, well, the reality is he probably worked with a lot more stone than he did with, with wood. That's just kind of my own little two cents. That really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the context of this story, but, but I like that because really what it tells us is that Joseph is just a blue collar guy, right? He's not, a, he's not a, a, a wealthy man. He's not this spiritual guy that worked in the temple. He is just your ordinary, everyday, average Joe. So Joseph comes from the line of David and he's a craftsman. Again, that's really all that we know. Like I said, Joseph didn't exactly have a starring role. So with that super in-depth context in mind, let's jump into our passages for this morning. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to look at just verses 18 and 19. It says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. I'm going to pause right there because uh, if you've read the Gospel of Matthew, you know that Matthew can be a little bit matter of fact. Or he just states the facts and then he kind of moves on with it. But, but what we miss, especially now being 2,000 years later, is really the gravity of this situation. Because what we have here actually are, are two young kids on the cusp of marriage. I say young because at the time Mary probably would have been about 14, 15 years old and Joseph probably somewhere around 18 or 20. So you've got two young kids, and they got their whole lives ahead of them. Not just their whole lives ahead of them, they actually had their, their, their family behind them, because this is an arranged marriage, which was really the, the typical thing of that day. But they're in this betrothal period, right? And this betrothal period is important. It's, uh, in Hebrew, it's called the Kiddushin. And it's this year-long period where the couple uh, was legally married, but they weren't able to, to live together or to sleep together during that period. I think most of us are familiar with that idea. We've heard this story enough times, but let me help you understand the purpose of this betrothal period. At least one of the purposes is because in these arranged marriages, what you would have is you would have the, the, the groom's family would pay a bride's price to the bride's family. Okay, so they would, they would pay a certain amount or, or give them a certain amount in exchange for the, the bride's hand in marriage. And so this betrothal period, it was really a way for the groom's family to protect their investment. See, they wanted to be sure that, that the bride was, was pure, and so they would wait this year to make sure that she wasn't already pregnant. Now, I don't know about y'all, I'm not sure why it took a full year. I think you normally can find that stuff out pretty quickly, but nevertheless, they decided to wait a whole year so that this couple could enter into a normal married life. And if you haven't connected the dots yet, here's why this is so important. It's because during this betrothal period, when she was not allowed to either live with or sleep with anybody, that Mary shows up pregnant. In fact, we actually see in the Gospel of Luke, right, the angel Gabriel comes and, and he tells Mary that, that she, she has uh, you know, conceived a child, right? And so Mary, she goes and she spends some time with her cousin Elizabeth and she comes back and shows up with Joseph with a baby bump, right? And all God's people said, uh-oh, <laughs> right? We've got a problem on our hands. This isn't the way things are supposed to go. She is supposed to be pure during this time. I want to ask you to put yourselves into Joseph's shoes for just a minute. Like your parents have just arranged this marriage to this, I'm assuming, pretty great girl. Right? And you start this, this, this betrothal period. You have this nice ceremony. And my guess is you've probably started to make some plans for your life. You're thinking, okay, like I'm going to marry this girl. We're going to, we're going to settle down in Nazareth. Maybe in a year or two, we'll, we'll start having some, some babies. I'll start building up my business and then boom. That all gets blown up when Mary turns up 
with that baby bump. Imagine the disappointment that Joseph must have felt. Imagine the, the pain of having all your dreams just destroyed right there in an instant. Not only that, but being, being publicly disgraced in the process. I don't know about y'all, that, that feels like a lot to handle, right? And yet Matthew tells us that Joseph is a just man, or that he is a righteous man. He doesn't want to put Mary to shame, or worse yet, to be punished for what anyone could only logically assume was infidelity. So he resolves to show her compassion and just to divorce her quietly. But then something happens. Something happens. And I'm not sure how much time passes between verses 19 and 20, but something happens there in the waiting. Matthew tells us in verse 20 that as Joseph considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, I don't want you to miss the weight of what Joseph is being asked to do here. Right? This angel shows up and, and he says, hey, I want you to take this woman, the center of this you know, town-wide scandal, the, the very source of your deepest pain. I want you to take her as your wife. And not only that, but I actually want you to accept the responsibility. I want you to accept uh, the, uh, the fact that you will be guilty by association. That your life, your, your reputation, it's never, ever going to be the same. And lastly, I want you to take this, this boy. I want you to raise him as your own son. Oh, and by the way, he happens to be the, the savior of the world, so no pressure, Joseph. <laughs> right? Not exactly an easy list for Joseph, is it? Everything he was being asked to do carried with it significant sacrifice. And it required him to have a true humility. And yet look how Joseph responds. There is a readiness, a willingness to do all that has been asked of him. In fact, if you notice, Joseph actually goes above and beyond the call of duty. Right? It, it says here that he actually chose not to sleep with Mary until after Jesus was born. Okay, so that's two full years of being essentially married without ever consummating their relationship. Nobody ever asked him to do this, right? No wonder why the Catholic Church made this guy a saint. <laughs> Two full years. I kid a little bit, but come on, like that's, that's impressive. This guy goes above and beyond the call of duty. He doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't raise any objections. He just walks the path the angel laid out for him. Ready, willing to make his life all about Jesus. Again, this is why Joseph's story needs to be told. Because he sets an example for us that is worth imitating. And so this morning, what I want to do with the rest of our time together, I want to take a look at his example. Because I want you to see what it looks like to be willing in the waiting. I want you to see how God used Joseph and how he might use you if you come with that same ready and willing posture with your own life. So we take a little closer look at Joseph's story. The first thing we see that stands out is that this is a guy who was ready, who was willing to change direction when the Lord called him to. Joseph was willing to change direction. He was willing for the Lord to alter his plans. And listen, I know that we live in a, in a time where, you know, careers seem to change every four to five years, and it might be a little bit more normal to us. But back then, man, you knew how life was going to kind of play out from a very early age, right? You, you typically would just live where your family lived, and you would inherit the business that your family ran. It's not to say that unexpected things didn't occur, but you could pretty typically kind of figure out the rest of your life from an early time. And I'm sure, like Joseph, he probably, some of him, like he enjoyed that fact. I mean, here we have a craftsman. I don't know if you guys are, know any craftsmen, if you're a craftsman yourself, but, but craftsmen or people in construction, they really like when things go according to plan. I've watched our, our brother Jay Mullen here. And I've been able to visit some of his projects and I see the eye that he has for detail. I see how much he loves when things go according to plan. When all the pieces and all the parts are there, when all the measurements are correct, right? Joseph probably liked this fact about his life. I'm more of a duct tape and super glue kind of guy myself. 
But you get what I'm saying here. My guess is that that change of plans probably wouldn't have been easy for Joseph to swallow. And yet, where do we find him? Ready and willing to do the Lord's will. And it's not just here either. It's not just in in this initial news. It is actually all throughout Jesus' childhood that we see this same readiness and willingness for Joseph. Right? It's that same readiness and willingness that we see that that, that gets him from Nazareth to Bethlehem with a pregnant wife on the back of a donkey. You got to be ready and willing to take on something like that. But then we see it again, right? When, when, when the angel comes and, 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 and tells, or sorry, when, when Joseph learns about King Herod coming after his child, he takes his, his wife and his newborn baby now 760 miles to Egypt. And then one more time, we see the Lord eventually gives them the all clear to go back to Nazareth, a journey that takes 900 miles, and he goes willingly. Because again, he knew that this was the path the Lord laid out for him. But here's what I need you to understand about all of this family. That is way more than just some painfully long road trips with a baby or a toddler. Yes, that would have been hard, but being a transient family couldn't have been easy either. Imagine Joseph going to Egypt, having to to learn a new language, having to find a a job, a source of income, having to, to be able to protect his family. Imagine going back to Nazareth, back to this place where where rumors would just swirl all about them, where people probably despised them because of what they assumed. It couldn't have been easy for him to swallow. And yet Joseph was ready and willing every time the Lord changed his direction because he knew family. His life was no longer about him. He knew now his life, every step he took, was all about Jesus. And for Jesus, we see that Joseph was willing to sacrifice everything. Now, as I was reading this this week, you know, I thought like, man, did it really have to be this way? I don't know if you read, you know, the, the gospels and these accounts and be like, did, did God really have to lead them on that path? Because let's be honest, if he would have sent Jesus, you know, to a, a wealthy family or to a, a military family or a royal family, like all of these challenges, they would have been taken care of. But instead, God chooses to send Jesus in a way that would ruin the reputation of two young kids. Instead, God chooses to send Jesus in a way that would would require them to sacrifice all of the plans they had for their lives. Instead, God chooses to send Jesus in a way that would demand of his parents the very same thing he would eventually command of each of us. A life not lived according to our plans, but according to the will of the Lord. So yes, I guess it did have to be this way. Because putting Jesus at the center of your life, family, it requires you to change direction. The question for you this morning is, are you willing to change direction? Are you willing to put your reputation, your your plans, your dreams for your life up on that altar? Are you willing to do whatever it takes to make your life all about Jesus? Because what we see in the Gospels, what we see in this story is that Jesus can't just be an accessory to a comfortable life. He must be the center of a life that is built on sacrifice. It's like I said a couple of weeks ago, Jesus is either the Lord over your entire life or he's Lord over none of it. And listen, I know that there are some of you, many of you who are living your lives this way. You are continually pouring yourself out, sacrificing for him. And if that's you, then let me just say, stay the course. You are headed in the right direction. But I'd have to imagine there are some of you here in this room and Jesus isn't at the center of your life. In fact, Jesus probably isn't even factoring into any of your decisions. And if that's you, then I just want to humbly suggest that you take a look at where your path is leading, where your plans will wind up, and that you ask the Lord to change your direction. Would you be open and willing to change direction this morning? That's the heart we see here in Joseph. And he didn't know where this path would ultimately take him, right? But he just willingly stepped forward in faith. How willing are you to take that next step of faith towards what God is calling you to? Because I believe what you'll come to find is that God doesn't want to just redirect your plans. He actually wants to redefine your purpose. Leads me to the second thing we see in Joseph's story. He wasn't just willing to change direction. He was also willing to play a different role. This is where sweet little Milo and that classic role he talked about come back into the picture. Right? Because for Joseph, as as a young Jewish man, right, one of his main purposes in life was to become a father. And in this patriarchal society, what would happen when you became a father is you, you became uh, the star of the show. 
right? And everybody else around you, your firstborn son, whoever, they, they would end up playing the role of supporting actor. But that's not the role that God had in mind for Joseph. That's not the role they had in mind. He wasn't going to be the star of the show because God had a different plan. God's plan was for Jesus to be in the starring role. And that plan, man, it redefined Joseph's purpose. His life was now to be uh, centered on his adopted son. And again, how does Joseph respond? He's willing, right? He's ready. And he, and he chooses to step out of the limelight in order to make his life all about Jesus. And I think this intentional choice is, is the reason why Joseph's character is one for us to imitate. Because let's be honest, most of us, we're not going to be like Mary, right? We don't often have an angel showing up and basically being like, hey, here's, here's what's going on. Here's how it's going to happen. You just go and do it. Instead, most of us, we find ourselves like Joseph. And we're presented with opportunities for obedience. They're opportunities for obedience. To discover a purpose far greater than the one we could have worked up or imagined on our own. And when we're presented with these opportunities, family, we are given a choice, right? We can choose to continue playing the role that we've always played, the role that we want to play, or we can choose to embrace the role that God has assigned to us, the one that he has designed specifically for us. So my question for you is, which role are you willing to play? Are you set on continuing to be the star of your own show? Or are you like Joseph, and like sweet little Milo, willing to, to step aside, willing to give Jesus the spotlight that he deserves. You know, a few stories reflect uh, this kind of humility like adoption stories do. And, and this past week, I got to hear a pretty incredible one. I was talking with a, a fellow pastor in the area, and he was telling me about his sweet little 11-year-old adopted son named Luis. He's telling me Luis just has his heart for the Lord, but, but he has a body that's just had dozens and dozens of medical challenges over his short life. Well, this pastor and his, and his family, they were well aware of those medical challenges when, the, when God put it on their heart to, to welcome Luis into their family through adoption. And yet they still willingly made that choice. They were presented with this opportunity for obedience, and they said Yes. But that would only be the beginning of the sacrifice God was inviting them to make. Because not long ago, they actually learned that Luis needed a kidney transplant. And as he told me the story, I learned about the, the, the church family that rallied around them. Just doing incredible things. And several of them even, even raised their hand to be a potential donor, but none of them were a match. None of them, except for Luis's adoptive mother. And in the same way, this family decided to, to, to follow the will of the Lord, to choose adoption. This woman, she willingly chose to make a sacrifice for her son. As I heard this story this, this week, I, I was blown away, right, at the faith of this family, this willingness to sacrifice. But more than anything, I was blown away at how God, by his grace, uses our obedience to fulfill his promises. Do you all see that? God, in his grace, uses our obedience to fulfill his promises. That's the same thing we see here in the story of Christmas. It's Joseph's willingness to say yes that led to God's promise becoming a reality. And it just has to make you wonder what promises God is longing to fulfill through your obedience. What might he do through you if you were ready and willing to play the role that he designed for you to play? Don't you want to know that, family? What would happen if you truly trusted in the Lord with all your heart, like Proverbs 3 says? If you didn't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, in all things you did, you submitted to his will. Proverbs 3, verse 6 tells us, right? It'll make our paths straight. In other words, he will, he will redirect your life. He will redefine your purpose so that your life will never, ever be the same. Family, don't you want to know what God can do with your yes? There's just one problem, right? We have this promise that's available to us, but yet some of us still find ourselves reluctant or even resistant to this. So why are we so reluctant? Why are we so resistant to follow God's will for our lives? I think it's actually pretty simple. We are reluctant to walk the path that God has for us because we are unsure of what lies at the end, right? Like if God would just show us what's at the end of these steps he's asking us to make, then, then most of us would willingly take them, right? 
But what happens, family, when we do this, when we are reluctant to walk the path that God has laid out for us, is that we put his blessings in the waiting. Let me say that again. When we are reluctant or resistant to walk the path that God has laid out before us, we put his blessings in the waiting. And I know this. I can say this confidently because I've experienced this firsthand. I know I've told the story many times before, but, but this whole pastoring thing was not exactly my idea. I was reluctant. I was resistant to it. And all it did was keep God's blessings in the waiting. Because look around. Look at all God was waiting to bless me with, to bless us with. If you can't help but wonder what he has in store for you. If you would just give him your yes and take that next faithful step. That leads me to the last question I want to ask you this morning as I invite the band back up. What is God calling you to do that you need to say yes to right now? What is God calling you to do that you need to say yes to right now? Maybe for some of you, he's calling you to change direction. To lay aside the plans that you have for your life and to follow his will and his word instead. Maybe for some of you, he's calling you to sacrifice. To, to give generously out of what you've been given. Maybe for some of you, he's calling you to discipleship. To pour out into the life of somebody else. Or maybe to be bold and to, to ask someone to, to pour into your life. What is God calling you to say yes to right now? I believe there may be somebody here that God is calling into foster care or into adoption. To opening up your life, your guest room, your heart to invite a child in. Let's not all know what God might be calling you to do. I don't know exactly what your yes might lead to, but I do know beyond the shadow of doubt, it will take you even deeper into God's story. That you will see him show up in ways you never imagined possible. I know what happens when pastors give this call. I know what you might be thinking right now. Like that just sounds too hard. All right, like that is, it's not just not the right time. But let me encourage you, family, would you be obedient anyways? Would you take just that next faithful step? It doesn't even have to be a leap. Just take that small step forward and watch how God illuminates your path. Here's the thing I know. God doesn't call us to do the kind of things we can do on our own. He calls us to do the kind of things that lead us to a deeper place of dependence on him. So say yes this morning. Say yes this morning to the one who said yes for you. See, family, Joseph may not have known it then, but we know now that everything God asked Joseph to do, his son would do in a much greater sense for him. Right, three decades later, Jesus would willingly give up his life. And just like his earthly father, Joseph, he would, he would suffer from being misunderstood, from being despised by men, falsely accused of things that he didn't do. But at the will of his heavenly father, he would be condemned and nailed to a cross, laying down his life in order that he might save ours. And here's the beauty, family. Because he said yes, we too can find the strength to say yes. Because right, Jesus didn't stay on that cross. Three days later, he rose again, and now he is with us in our waiting by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's because he said yes, we too can say yes. And God in his grace will use our obedience to fulfill his promises. He will use our willingness when we say yes, family, to point others to him. See, I spent the whole week studying the life of Joseph and I finally figured out why this guy is so forgotten. It's because that's the way he wanted it. He didn't want anybody to remember him. He wanted everybody to remember Jesus. Joseph knew his whole life was about pointing others to Jesus. So yes, he strived to be a righteous man. I'm sure he tried hard at being a, a good father, an honest craftsman. But he knew that his ultimate priority was to point others to Jesus. See, there is, have been books upon books written about, hey, why does he not have any lines in scripture? Why does this guy just sort of disappear? 
And as I read these scholars, I'm like, y'all are missing the point. Because Joseph's point was to point others to Jesus. And friends, we share that same role with him. So the call this morning is simple. Each of us are to be like Joseph. To be ready and willing to change direction when the Lord calls. To be eager to embrace the role that he has given us. And to give him our yes to whatever it is he is calling us to do.